So I decided to uh, look at it differently. I said, okay, just like you look in a mirror, you see the reverse reflection. I said, let's pretend it's not caused by something you're doing. It's caused by loss of a protective factor. That could be one reason something increases in frequency. What if you're losing a protective factor? Now suddenly you start seeing things very differently. Okay, yeah, the Z started going up in the 40s, and it started doing this in the 50s, and it spread to this group in the 60s, and now it's going up here, north-south gradients. So, so what, what are you losing when you go from the south and go into the north of the country? Or uh, when you're in an industrialized way, you're losing exposures to infectious diseases. You're, you're, you're drinking cleaner water, you're, you're eating cleaner food. Um, and a lot of these things are related to infections at one level or another. What if it's a lack of exposure? Now, my background is in immunology, and my background mm -hmm. is also in parasitology. And um, for many years, we knew that helmets had very unique interactions with hosts. That when people had helmets, they triggered TH2 responses, certain types of immune responses, They're very unique to helmets, and that they really dampened human immune responses. So I said, well, how dangerous are these organisms? Now, some of them are, but when you think of the billions of people who carry them, the amount of disease reported based on people having them is trivial and small. So then I said to myself, well, maybe they're not that dangerous. Take like the United States 1930s. If you check the stools of children going to elementary school in the rural south, I, 30 to 70 percent of them will have helmets in their GI tract. These are healthy children. They don't have diarrhea. They're not stunted growth. It's just there. These were just public health surveys. Say, mom, bring in a stool sample. And you can find this public health data. It's not in the scientific literature. It's public health data. We had to get um, things from public health services buried um, in various states to, to actually see the actual data. It's that they don't publish it. Mm -hmm. so, so when we started doing some of this, we said, yeah, it was real common in the United States. And, and they obviously picked these communities because they suspected it would be common. But they didn't report on the kids being ill. It's just the way it was. If you go to Indonesia, if you go to Africa, if you go to um, less developed countries today where kids are just running, playing in the street, most of them have helmets in the GI tract. This is the, when you, and then you think about it, well, what about humans uh, 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 300 years ago, 100 years ago? We weren't treating people for helmets. They must have all had it. It's thought experiments. I'm saying, well, all right, so helmets may not be that bad. They may not be dangerous. But then I'm thinking, why is IBD going up? And I, and I know about when they start deworming. So you're deworming in the 30s, and then you're doing the, so the Jewish kids in the 1930s were wearing shoes. And they were walking on the, on the concrete in New York City. Their parents were relatively well-to-do, well-educated. They ate kosher food, so they avoided pork. Pork, about 25% of the American population had a helmet from just eating the pork in the 1930s. So these kids weren't exposed to that. And the first patients uh, described to have uh, Crohn's disease were the Jewish kids in New York. Hmm. So I said, wait a minute here. <laughs> Could this be a crossover? And uh, putting it together in my mind, I say, well, deworming in the 30s, rates in the 40s. Uh, this population, then suddenly it appears in that group. So um, it correlated well with hygiene, clean water, clean food, lack of exposure to helmets. It, it looked to me like a pretty good fit. I mean, it fit the known epidemiology. Now, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I went to several of them, even when we first thought of the idea, and I sat with them. I said, look, this is the data we have on IBD. What experiment do I need to do? To, to show that the epidemiology, the reverse correlation, is correct. And the guy, he was very knowledgeable, very authoritative, and he said, you, you've got it already. It's done. I mean, you could do it again, you could do it a little differently, but you've got the correlation. Now, cause and ca uh, showing cause and effect is a different story. Epidemiology, for the most part, does not show what causes a problem. Sure. It just shows correlation. Sure. Then, Cause and effect is another issue. So um, he was pretty confident, yeah, it fits. All right, now we got something that fits. Now, is it right? 
So the next thing we did is we have animal models of inflammatory bowel disease. Mm -hmm. We said, okay, let's try it on some of our mouse models and, and see if it does anything. It doesn't make the colitis worse. It doesn't make it better. First easy way to determine if there's any traction to this. We know that these worms can trigger regulatory pathways and um, perhaps it would um, do something. So we tried two different mouse models. We tried uh, two different worms and we got protection. So it's observational, but okay. They don't necessarily make it worse. They can make it better. Now we're off and running. All right, so we have an uh, epidemiologic observation. We have a mouse model that shows that these organi a organism that's a helminth can make a difference. <clears throat> now the theory has potential. So what's the name of this, this worm, the, the species name? Uh, H. polygyrus. H. polygyrus, okay. And it's a, it's a murine whipworm. Yes. Okay. Do you infect the mice with adult worms or the ova? Uh, with this, with this uh, larva. With the okay, these are larvae. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what I do is I, uh, after we sac sacrifice the animal, we roll the colon to look at the colitis, and then um, after we roll it, we put it in a formula for overnight for mm -hmm. 24 hours, and then um, I take it out, and what I did is I cut it right in the center. Okay. A cross section? A cross section, so it'll be a clean cut. So we So uh, this will go to histology and then they will wax it. it. So when they cut it like this, it will be a really cut sharp mm -hmm. right. cut. And then you can look at just the, the micromorphology of the... Yeah. Then you can look at the slide. The slide will come back like this. Yes, we have one here. Okay, cool. Yeah. And what types of things are you looking for in the morphology of the... We're looking at inflammation, yep. Okay. Um, Look at the muscular layer, look at the uh, epithelium, and look at the lemma propria to see if there's any infiltration of the lymphocyte. Right. Okay.